record to my computer. Yay. And we are recording. So everyone yeah. should see that pop on in the top left of their screen now. Awesome. So again, Zoom is a cloud-based video conferencing software that's now utilized by a lot of people around the world, uh, given the current state of things. So what does Zoom do and why do we, uh, how is it used? So we can use Zoom for a lot of different things. Why Zoom is especially dynamic is you can use it for small events or large events. Um, personally, I use it for one-on-one -on -one meetings with my manager. I use it for one-on-one -on -one meetings with people on my staff. Um, we also have group meetings on here. I just uh, had a meeting with everybody in our company, um, about 80 people from four different time zones across the US um, on a meeting all together. So it really helps to make the digital real and tangible. Um, it lets you do things like screen share. It lets you do things like record. Um, there are also fun features in there where you can do things like breakout rooms or polls and Q and A's and other things like that that make it really dynamic as um, a conferencing tool. Um, and how do people use it? Um, meetings, of course, webinars like this situation, um, community gatherings is something that we've seen uh, emerge a little bit more, uh, as well as fun things like happy hours, family dinners. I have a Zoom family dinner with my family once a week um, where I Zoom my family members from Hawaii and we get together and share a meal and look at each other's faces and tell each other about our week. Um, we've also done game nights, movie nights, and I also have done music lessons with our ukulele class and also seen some people doing some really great things with, um, with Taiko classes online as well. So high level, that's what it does and why. So how do you join a Zoom meeting? All of you just joined a Zoom meeting. It's very simple. Uh, what you do is you'll have basically a link or a meeting ID. You can join via phone or you can join via the link. And all you have to do is share this, uh, this link that's highlighted here. Um, every meeting session that you have has its own individual ID that, specify, that is specified as part of this link here. And you literally just have to click on it. Um, if you're accessing a Zoom meeting from a mobile phone, uh, you can call in and enter in that ID. There's an option for phone. There's an option for computer. There's also an option for the app. Um, and we'll go through all of those as well. So if you don't have the Zoom app installed, you'll experience something like this, uh, like this right here, which is it gives you an option to download the app itself, or you can run the meeting from your browser. Some, uh, some computers, depending on your situation, may not have the system requirements to download the app. You also might be on a business computer that has restrictions on what can be downloaded or activated. You can always opt to join from your browser. There are some limitations that we've listed here. So in certain browsers like Safari, you may not be able to screen share. Um, there might be some limitations uh, based off of the web client, which is in the browser versus the app itself. Um, so what we're running on right now is the app and the app will have a lot more um, different features that you can utilize. Uh, so our purposes, probably the biggest feature you'd be missing is if you're wanting to participate in something that has a breakout room. Um, there are limitations that if you're participating from a web client, you can't actually be sorted into a breakout room. Um, so that would be something to communicate with the host ahead of time if you know that those are happening. But the turnaround side to that is that that main room does still exist and you'd be able to stay in there. So the main room would essentially just become another meeting room. But that'd be good to communicate um, with the host if you know that you're going to be going to a breakout room and have to use the webinar client or have to use the web client so that they can prepare for that. Yeah. And again, we'll be sharing out these slides, so you can always share this with um, anybody that might be joining a Zoom meeting for the first time and wants to know what to expect. So again, this is if you do not have the Zoom app installed, and this is if you already have it installed. Um, all you have to do is say yes, open Zoom, and the meeting starts. So this is an option of joining a meeting with an ID and an app. So if you are starting it from an app itself, you'll see a login screen like this where you can either join a meeting or log in if you have a login. So you don't have to have a Zoom account in order to join a meeting. You can also just enter in uh, the meeting ID uh, from, that you got in the email that somebody had provided to you and then join with your name as how you want it to be listed. Uh, and then it gives you these options. Uh, remember my name, 
connect or don't connect to audio and then turn on or off your video. So when you join the meeting itself and maybe like you haven't brushed your teeth for the day or something like that, you want to uh, make sure that it doesn't show your video right away, uh, you'll have that option. And this is the option for dialing in. So on a mobile phone, and I have to be, I have to say that I'm guilty of this is like, sometimes I have to join a Zoom meeting and I'm in my car. Um, I wanna avoid as much as possible, you know, dialing the phone while you're in the car. You can press this. I have my phone in its little holster that's on my car. I can just literally tap this, this one tap mobile right here. And it has everything you'll need in it and it connects automatically through my Bluetooth system and allows me to just dial into a meeting um, as opposed to utilizing this link. You know, it like starts in the web client of all these different things. If you just join from your phone, it's just this one tap mobile option and just um, zooms you directly into the meeting mm -hmm. itself. The um, differences between those two would be video or not. So if you yeah. do the one tap mobile, you are just doing a purely audio connect. You're not going to be able to see video nor even be able to give video. Um, so if you do download the app to your phone, then you could use that meeting link that's at the top to connect on your phone still and open the app and do video. Um, but if you're just going to do purely audio, that one tap mobile lets you call in without having to punch in anything else. It's going to enter the meeting for you and then dial you in directly with audio. And once you're in, you'll hear people start to talk. Um, also, sorry, one more note about the audio is when it does dial you in, also you can see there's no options to kind of name yourself or identify yourself as there were in the others. So while we say it's good to mute yourself upon entry, sometimes you may listen carefully. The host might say, oh, who just joined us? Because all it's going to list is your phone number. So keep an eye out for that. And you might just need to unmute yourself for a moment to let them know who is the mysterious phone number on the participant list. And then go ahead and mute yourself again while getting a scene. Yes. Um, so this is a look at kind of what it looks like when you first join. So when you first join a Zoom meeting, you'll get this option to join audio. Uh, it gives you an option to join computer audio, which is personally what I'm on right now. Um, it takes basically the audio feed from your webcam uh, that already exists or your speakers on your computer. If you're plugged in with headphones like I am right now, it's pulling this from the headphone mic on, uh, on my headphones. Um, but what's also great is it lets you call in via phone. I previously had a computer that didn't have a working microphone. Um, so I either had to always have headphones or dial in with my phone. So it gives you, again, this phone number once you're in the meeting client to join, and then you uh, enter in a meeting ID and a participant ID, and it matches together the phone feed with uh, the person that has dialed in. So mm -hmm. it gives you some different options for audio. Um, and if you're on a meeting and you're on your computer audio, but something isn't going right, maybe your computer is overtaxed like mine, um, or your computer, yeah, or you're having <laughs> some issues with people can't hear you, you can, uh, oh no, go back. You can <laughs> click on this little carrot that you'll see and all of you can kind of follow along with me. You might be able to mouse over uh, either the bottom or the top of your screen. You should see some navigation buttons there. Uh, there's one that says mute with a little carrot next to it. That'll give you all of the options for um, having different feeds coming in. You might see different options for speakers. Uh, there's an option there to leave computer audio and switch to phone. That's a quick way of how to switch between computer audio and phone audio if you're having any issues with your computer audio or any issues with, um, with the input that's there. Um, it also lets you test uh, your speakers and other, uh, other things like that. So uh, this little carrot here next to the mute button will give you a lot of different options for troubleshooting your audio if you're having any issues connecting. Um, the next thing that we'll talk through is, oh, actually, this is kind of a little bit more detail. Uh, the computer audio, phone audio, we talked about that already. Um, and then it also gives you options for sharing webcam. So this little carrot right next to the video icon itself will give you the options for video. You'll see here that there's different ways of showing yourself. You can do the 16 by 9 widescreen or you can do an original ratio, which kind of makes you, and I'm gonna actually do this 
while we're, um, I'm going to stop share for a little while so you can see the differences and my head is bigger. Uh, but and you can also be, try this for yourselves. So if you yeah. can a little carrot and open up those video settings. So if I'm in, I'm in the video settings right now, I'm not sure if you can, you will not be able to see this, but I can enable HD. I can switch to original ratio, which makes it a little bit square, or I can do a 16 by nine to like fill in everything. Um, there's also this fun little feature that like lets you touch up your appearance. If you notice, look how beautiful my skin looks right now <laughs> because it put a little blur on there. Um, so I'll take that off and you can see the normal. Um, there's also some, audio, some different uh, options in there where it'll say turn off your video when you join a meeting. Again, in these situations where maybe you're joining a meeting with like 20 other people and you don't really want all of them to know what you look like, you can um, opt to turn off your video when you join a meeting. Um, and there's some other different features in there as well. So all of those uh, exist within that video panel. And so let me go back to sharing so we can see the PowerPoint again. Ooh. And there's just a couple of best practices here. We'll, we'll review the best practices again at the end of the call. But I want to iterate that when you join a call, muting yourself is just common courtesy. Um, again, my dog is very loud and he barks a lot. And it doesn't help that, you know, if my CEO is trying to explain something or if my group leader or whoever's leading the call is explaining something and then my dog is barking, other people can't hear either. So I always opt to mute myself. I'm personally also sometimes a heavy breather. I'll pick up some inhales and exhales. Uh, so it's always kind of a good idea to mute yourself um, on audio when you join any type of, uh, not limited to Zoom, but any type of kind of teleconferencing meeting. Um, and just a little, a little tip also, be aware of what your background looks like. Um, it, some people may or may not be comfortable with people seeing, you know, a stray laundry or um, sometimes children playing in the background. It's just something to be aware of. Not saying that there's anything wrong with any of your backgrounds. You all have lovely homes. Uh, but I'm going to show you a little trick next that will be really fun to play with um, called virtual backgrounds as well. So, okay, we'll get there. Oh, man. I'm going to jump around a little bit because I want to get to these virtual. Oh, wait, did we take it out? Virtual backgrounds? Maybe that's later. Is the slide not there? Well, we could always just demonstrate. So I'm going to do something real fun again and show you guys virtual backgrounds because I think that's a really good point right now. Um, if you all go to the video settings and the little carrot, there's uh, video settings and it allows you to select a virtual background. So you'll see video settings and, the, and then the option for choose virtual background. Um, you can set yourself. There are a few that come directly with the Zoom feature or you know, come stock with Zoom itself. This is one of them, the San Francisco background. Um, you can also be in space. Ooh. Oh, great, you got it, yeah, nice. Like, so it's, it's a good way of hiding um, things that you, you might not want people to see behind you. Some computers are not set up for this, so if you don't have, uh, if you don't meet certain system requirements, this may or may not appear for you. Um, you can also add in your own background. So I'm a Disney fan. I have these Pixar things in the background. Yeah, you can add your own photos um, and kind of have fun with it. So a virtual background is a great way to kind of keep some level of privacy um, within Zoom itself. So I'm going to select none right now and proceed on with the share screen feature. So jumping back into our presentation, um, a huge benefit, I think, of Zoom is the flexibility with sharing. So screen sharing, uh, which is what I'm doing right now, this is a PowerPoint that, or a um, slide deck that we created on Google Docs. So you guys are actually looking at my Google Chrome screen right here. Um, when you have the, sh when you activate screen sharing, it should appear in the, um, the panel, either at the top or bottom of your screen. You should see, you know, mute, stop video, participants, share. So share uh, will pop up this window right here. Um, and it may not let you share because you can only share one screen at a time right now with the settings we have. Uh, but you have these different options that you can utilize. So I have three screens in front of me, which you guys cannot really tell. 
except for the fact that it's here that there are the screens. You can opt to share your full screen uh, or your full desktop. If you only have one screen, then it'll show one. Um, you'll you'll see just kind of like one uh, one sh screen share option. Um, there's a whiteboard option where you can actually draw like a chalkboard, um, or you can share a specific app itself. So when Sarah and I were planning this webinar, if I just wanted to share our outline, um, it would just be sharing this specific window. So there would be no risk of, uh, you know, if I were to minimize my desktop window and there was some sort of embarrassing picture um, in the background or some embarrassing, you know, like maybe I was watching a funny YouTube video or something, um, there would be no risk of that if you just share one item at a time. Um, Alternatively, if you don't want to toggle between different apps, you can share your full screen, um, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, and you can, in that situation, you would see like somebody's desktop background or, you know, somebody's apps that they might have open and things like that. So that's another best practice that I will say is just kind of be aware of what's on your computer before you screen share. Um, I know of some horror story situations or cringeworthy situations where somebody didn't realize that they had certain tabs open maybe you're at work and you had, you know, another job search going on at the same time and accidentally shared that with your boss um, and that sort of thing. Uh, yes. So somebody, Sophia actually asked a really great question mm -hmm. about audio that is very applicable right now. So if you are going to share your screen and you want to share audio, let's say you're having a movie night or you want to share like she, like she was talking about um, an Omiyage video. There's an option, um, if you click on the three dots as you're screen sharing, this appears when you are screen sharing, um, and it'll say share computer sound. It's towards the bottom of the list in these three dots, um, and it gives you the option of sharing the sound that comes out of your computer, um, as opposed to the ambient noise just coming in from your microphone. So, um, so if, you, if you activate that, then it will, uh, it will bring up the share computer sound. So you might not see that now, but at another point, if you're trying out the share screen, then once you actually are sharing screen yourself, those options will pop up for you. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to note to you that you can change the orientation of where this panel appears um, when you are sharing screen. There's this little button that appears here, this arrow. I know personally, sometimes when I share screen, if I'm trying to get to something that's up here, uh, that or down here where, you know, if I'm trying to show something and I can't get to a click point or I can't get to a button, you can move this, uh, you can change the place that this, is, this bar is kept. Um, you cannot do it if you're not sharing screen, but I just wanted to point that out as well. Um, okay, next. Oh, I that. <laughs> click. The other Hi. arrow. So navigation overview, um, if all of you want to do this with me, there's a few different options on your Zoom kind of navigation. There's an invite option, which allows you to add another person to the meeting. Let's say you have a friend that's late to the meeting. Um, you can easily, there should be options there to uh, copy the URL. You can easily just kind of toss that into an email and quickly send it off to them if they're like, oh no, I'm running late and I can't find the invite. Um, that's an easy way to give that to someone. Um, you can also invite a person via email. Uh, there's a feature there to do that as well. Um, the Manage Participant tab, all of you should be experts in this already because I see that some of you have either changed your name um, or have kind of brought that up on the side. The, the um, Manage Participant tab is actually one of the most dynamic parts of a Zoom uh, that was, in my opinion, a little bit revolutionary when it came out. If you click on that uh, Manage Participant tab, you'll see options there uh, for raising a hand, for uh, saying yes or no, giving feedback to the uh, presenter to say go faster or slower. Um, there's more options there where I can say, oh, I need a break. So if you guys have that panel open, you'll <laughs> see these things here where you can uh, activate uh, different features. So you can say, oh, I agree. Uh, that was a great, that was a great thing, or, oh, no, no, Elise, I don't agree, disagree right here, or you can, Sarah just changed hers to, I need a break, like, you can do all of those things there, and kind of quickly communicate to the speaker or to the presenter how you're feeling about something, um, and, 
and and as a, a host of a meeting or as an organizer of a meeting this also allows you to mute everybody so let's say that if you notice when i'm speaking my microphone volume is going up and down if i notice that let's say stan stan has a let's say stan is at taiko practice and i can hear the ambient noise from like the shime that's coming through we can mute stan and say hey like no none of that sorry stan i'm sure you're very respectful on screen share but um i mean it just gives you some options there to um to mute people's audio and, and other things like that um we also wanted to point out that as part of this you can also uh if you mouse over your name there should be an option to mute and there should be a button that says more so that allows you to rename yourself so if it comes in sometimes when i have logged into tca accounts it'll announce me as tca tech or tca office and i want people to know me as my name elise i can write that in there uh, we've also seen some really great uh iterations of of, of different uh sessions that people have had where you also include you know your title group name so i'm going to encourage all of you to go in there right now and rename yourself and add in your title group name and the city that you're from so if you feel so inclined uh also considering that the session is being recorded if you want to share that you can and if you don't that's okay too but i'm going to go in here and i'm going to say jin daiko from mountain view california that is my title group name and I'm going to say okay and as you can see that has also changed it for my um my video here so you should see it below my name now Elise Fujimoto Jindaiko Mountain View California so that's a quick way to get to know people um on your zoom chat and a quick way to make the digital real so if you're having these meetings with new people if you're having a webinar like I haven't met a lot of you in person this is a quick way of kind of getting that um getting those introductions um uh visible it's also There's a great all... way to kill time at the beginning of a meeting if yeah. you feel like you're waiting for a bunch of people to join and you need to give them something to do and you want to make sure like you might be utilizing it later and you want to make sure that everybody knows how to do that so you can start kind of getting that out of the way at the head while you're still waiting for people to join your meeting yeah um other features that are available as well polls so if we went in here i pre-added some polls in here. So uh, since we're all on this call, I'm gonna launch a poll right now. Um, you don't have to answer, but I just activated like a general check-in poll. Um, the, if you wanna utilize this for uh, the t any of the TCA uh, Zoom channels, you we highly recommend that you work with us to do this. You need to work with the account owner in order to get this, um, to get this feature activated. But if you have a Zoom account of your own, you can activate the poll itself within your um, within your admin settings on your Zoom account, mm -hmm. and then any of the accounts that are attached to that Zoom admin can activate any of these polls. So, very quickly, we're just kind of I'm gonna give people maybe like another five seconds to fill this out, um, and we're gonna end polling. This is an anon. There's an option for anonymous versus not anonymous. I'm gonna end the polling option right now. And um, I can have the option to share the results. So I'm going to share that real quick. And you can see kind of the response of how people have responded. So I asked the question just generally how you're feeling today. Most people said they're feeling good, 50%. Um, have you tried any of the following to stay active while sheltering in place? And a lot of people are spending time exercising, calling friends and family, um, and other things like that. So, mm -hmm. and I'm going to stop sharing right now. So that's just a fun little feature yeah. that exists. And you'll notice too that on the meeting, you can see Elise is in my name. You'll see Elise is the host and I'm the co-host. So part of the reason that we say that if you want to use TCA's channels and you want to use polls you need to ask us is that we'll have to pop into your meeting real quick at the beginning and just make you a co-host of that meeting because technically your host will not otherwise be present. Um, but then otherwise the co-host, I'm able to control the poll on my side of things to the same degree that the host is able to. Yes. Absolutely. So we also went over share screen, um, but the chat is also very useful. Um, we utilize chat a lot. Uh, if there are, oh no, where did my chat thing go? See, sometimes these things are just a little bit funky. Um, but chat exists. Oh, oh my God! It's because I popped it out. You guys are all pros at using chat, but chat chat is a great way of activating um, anything that is best expressed via text. So questions or links 
Um, a lot of times we'll reference resources. That's a great place to put those centralized resources so uh, people can all click on the same thing and have access to it. Um, and you can also specify a chat to everyone or if you have a specific uh, thing that you want to send specifically to, let's say, to Kurt. If I, wanted to, if I wanted to send a message specifically to Kurt, I could specify that I want to send it to Kurt and, uh, and ask him a question directly. Or he can and it'll say directly. Yeah. in red right next to that, it'll let you know that it's private so you can be sure that you're only messaging Kurt. But the one caution that we'll say with that is if you receive a private message from somebody, the chat box will automatically change your setting from everyone to responding privately to that person. So sometimes the chat is flying by when there's too many people in there and you don't even notice somebody messaged you. So it's good because if you notice that your chat has switched to private, you know that you may have missed a message from somebody, but also you wanna take care that then you don't start answering things intended for everyone just to that person privately and all of your messages go unseen. Um, so just be mindful when you go over to message, just double check that blue thing and make sure that it's intended for the person you're intending it for, whether that's everyone or a private message. Yeah. Um, and then the last feature that we'll go through right now in this slide is the record functionality, which we are utilizing as well. So if you're um, the host uh, of a meeting, you have the option of recording the session for uh, later use. Uh, there's two options when you record. You can record to the cloud, which is to a centralized Zoom repository for your account, or you can record on your local computer. So that just means that at the end of the meeting, um, do you want the recording to be stored centrally in the cloud or do you want it to be stored on your computer? If you are utilizing TCA's uh, Zoom channels, we ask that you record on your local computer, um, mostly because we have to pay for storage space and meetings are a lot of storage. So, um, so if you record your, your session and you store it on your computer, that saves us some of the storage space that we're utilizing for our own meetings. Um, but it's a great functionality to have. Uh, it allows you to have a resource immediately after um, the session. Oh my gosh, click. So now Sarah is going to go through some of the terms of use for TCA's community Zoom. Oh, that's me. I was reading the chat where Karen offered a good point, just saying that um, one benefit for the cloud is that it does offer you a link that you could share with others. Um, after this meeting, we'll be sharing out, um, we've put some resources together on our site from Zoom because Zoom actually has a pretty incredible compendium of tutorials and resources for teaching you how to use its product. But it's such a powerful one that there's a lot of stuff there and it can be overwhelming. So we pulled out some of the ones that we think highlight what are the most common use cases. And one of those is if you're recording locally, how you can share out more easily with others and a couple of um, pieces of advice there, because we do know that if you're using TCA Zoom, you'll be sharing locally. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then we can help you with some of those options on how you can share it if you've saved it locally, because as Kurt said, it's the biggest of files. Um, so talking about the TCA community Zoom, since you're all here learning about how to use Zoom, um, you may not be in a position right now where you want to invest in having your own. And so that's why TCA is here to help with that. So we have three channels that we've dedicated that folks can reserve time on and use for their own. But we do have a couple of terms of use of these since they are communities. So first we do ask the person reserving that space be a TCA member. That does not mean that every person on the call has to be a TCA member, just the person reserving it. Um, so please be mindful of that. But otherwise, even if it's just the person reserving it and everyone else is not, that's okay. But it helps us to just keep the congestion a bit light. Um, when you're using it also because the purpose of this is to support people who otherwise cannot get their own Zoom account. Um, we are instigating that you cannot use the TCA Zoom accounts for commercial use. So if you want to use Zoom to teach private lessons and you're charging for those private lessons, um, that would not be a use case that you could utilize TCA Zoom, but we could help you coordinate with Zoom to maybe get the cheapest possible account for yourself. So you could have your own private account for that. Um, but otherwise, you could, you could use it to talk about things, like if you're planning a fundraiser, go ahead and talk about that fundraiser. Just don't actually use us to host the fundraiser in a Zoom meeting. Um, so there's some of those use cases. But if you're not sure and you, you think, oh, maybe this is okay, maybe it's not, you can just go ahead and email us. The point person in this case would be Paul Sakamoto. Um, so Paul at taikocommunityalliance.org. If you're not sure, just go ahead and ask him and we can talk it through with you and figure out what would work best. Um, and the last big terms of use would be first come, first serve. 
So if you want to make an appointment, again, you would email Paul to let him know, hey, I'm interested in using this. How do I get set up? Paul will ask you a couple questions to figure out what your use case is, and then he'll go out and share that document with you. So we just have a big, big shared Google spreadsheet where you can put your name down and schedule an appointment. Um, and it's basically first come, first serve. So we do have three channels so that if three people wanted the same day, same time, hopefully it's not four people. But if there were four people and somehow that happened because maybe it's everybody on the East Coast using it at the same time, it would be first come, first serve. Um, you have the option of reaching out to people to try and negotiate a time if you're trying to get a big group together and you could only settle on that, but ultimately you'd have to respect the times that are set there already. Um, and again, if that becomes an issue for you, if you're finding you're not ever able to get the times that you need, you could reach out to Paul and we'll see what we can do. Slide, please. Um, how do you sign up? I guess I just talked through that, didn't I? I jumped the slide. Um, did I miss anything in here? Ah, okay. The last thing that I'll let you know about is when you are in that spreadsheet, each of these channels, as we've said, good question from Stan that I'll get to in just a moment. Each of these channels has a separate link. So just like we sent you the meeting link to this room, each of our TCA community Zoom channels has a link. Um, so once you've scheduled your meeting, let's say there's channel A, channel B, channel C, you'd look at the top of that page and at the top of that page is the link that you'd have to share out with your attendees. And we'll touch a little bit more on this in the future when we're talking about best practices and keeping yourself safe while using Zoom, but you cannot post that link to a public forum. So if you were to share it with your attendees, you need to share it through a private email or through Messenger, some kind of private just between you and them feature. Um, and at the end of each week on Sunday, after the last appointments for Sunday, we actually change all of those links just to make sure that not too many people have access to the same links. Um, so everyone kind of gets a fresh start each week. Um, otherwise, if you want a demo of that form or anything to that extent to understand it a little bit more clearly, again, you can reach out to Paul and Paul will help you with that. Stan asked the question, is there a time limit like max two hours? Technically speaking, no. So if you had a free Zoom account and you didn't want to go through the TCA community Zoom, there is a time limit of 40 minutes. That's Zoom's free tier. Um, and as a free tier, sorry, as a licensed tier, which is what TCA is, is there is no limit. What we do ask is that you just be considerate of the other people making appointments. Um, so if you feel like you need longer than two hours or longer than three hours, maybe check in with us and we can kind of let you know what are some low um, low frequency times that might be best to host that. Otherwise, kind of read the room and, and use your best judgment about how we can keep it the most equitable for everybody involved. Um, and as far as an attendance limit, which Karen made the point of, for hours we've upgraded, so technically there's an attendance limit of 300 people. Um, if you're planning on hosting something that is going to max out that 300 people, probably check with us and we'll just make sure that that's all going to go smoothly for you. Um, but for the most part, no. Um, we've, we've gone beyond, technically speaking, usually there's a 100 limit and so we have expanded beyond that 100 limit and now each of our channels has a max capacity of 300. Um, so as long as your bandwidth can stand it, you'll have the capacity that you need. Um, if you're using the free account, I believe the free accounts also do have that limit of 100, which is basically you plus 99 people. I also want to add to oh, that, sure. like, it is definitely possible to have a successful event with, let's say, 300 people on Zoom. Um, but we will get to some options at the end of this. Uh, there is a certain point where it might be better to utilize the webinar feature of Zoom mm -hmm. as opposed to the meeting feature of Zoom. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that at the end, but as a segue into our next week's conversation. But great questions all around. Yeah. And being mindful of folks' time, I realize even though we started late, we're also technically past what we are scheduled to end. So if you do need to hop off, just a reminder that we are recording this and we will share it out. And we appreciate you guys sticking with us. Um, but don't feel shy if you do need to hop off. We'll totally yeah. understand. Otherwise, you're welcome to stick it out for the duration of this recording. And we'll do some Q&A at the end. Uh, just to go through some best practices uh, for audio, we have uh, a few different situations here. So again, talk through already, mute yourself. Uh, and then uh, there's also this feature within the audio settings itself to allow users to select original sound. So this actually is really great uh, that Jen pointed out earlier uh, with to, to Sarah um, that 
because Zoom has this kind of selective audio setting, uh, when their group had tried utilizing Zoom for Tycho practice, it was actually not picking up the Tycho because it identified it as background ambient noise. So it was excluding that and only picking up people's voices. So there is an option within the audio settings to say allow option for using original sound from microphone in meeting, a mouthful, but it's available within that um, audio settings tab. If you go to the little carrot that's next to the mute button, um, you should see an option for audio settings. It'll open up a new window. That space there, there's, uh, there is an option to say allow option for original sound. Um, there's also some shortcuts. Uh, if you press the M, button on your keyboard that automatically mutes you or unmutes you. Uh, in some cases, you can also uh, hold the space bar if like, let's say some, you know, your spouse or your roommate is asking you a question and you need to just momentarily mute. You can just quickly press that space bar for the duration of this quick interaction, un uh, release the space bar, and then you can go back to speaking normally. Um, the other option, or sorry, the other best practice is if using headphones or a single source of audio. Um, I know some of us uh, have been on calls where you just hear a lot of feedback. And that happens when you have two sources of audio in the same location on one call. So let's say Sarah and I were actually in the same location. She's on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. But if we were having this, um, this session at this, in the same place, uh, we should use one phone to dial into the meeting, even though both of us are on two different computers. So it is possible to tie a single source of audio to two different accounts or in one, you know, in, in a single location so that they, you can be heard, but that there's no feedback. Um, a way to work around that also is to use headphones. So if you're, you know, let's say you're in the same location as somebody else and there's no getting around it or you, you kind of just forgot about what, how to do this and it's too much to think about, just put in headphones. Easy way to, to get rid of that like uh, competing sound. Yeah. If um, anybody knows Sodaiko, you know that we have a lot of spouses in the group, and now that they're always in the same room when we have Zoom meetings, we've been going through this a lot, trying to figure out how to get everybody onto their own window, but have their own audio control. Um, headphones, I would highly recommend for this, and then making sure that you just have one input source. Yeah. Um, and then switching to phone. I had to do this for the duration of my last computer because my microphone broke early on. Uh, so Zoom has this amazing functionality, again, to dial in via phone. Also works if you have a slow internet connection. Um, you can dial in with the phone and have a clear and crisp audio, provided your phone is also in good working order. Um, but it's a, it's a good kind of best practice to be aware of. Best practices in video. Show yourself. So I think it's a lot more dynamic to see us here talking to you versus just kind of having this voiceover. Uh, going through things. And it can also help, again, making the digital real. TCA has been doing this for a long time, uh, where we have people all over the country, uh, some people West Coast, East Coast, Japan, uh, you know, uh, different parts of Europe. Like it's, it's easy to forget that there's a person behind an email. And especially with these times that we have going on right now, it's, it's, it's a lot more personal to be able to see someone's face and reaction um, on a call. So don't be afraid to show yourself. Again, be aware of recordings. Uh, so you know, if you don't want to be recorded, those types of things, like in this mm -hmm. situation, totally fine. But if don't be afraid organizing, to show yourself. If you're organizing a meeting, it is a good conversation to have with everyone ahead. So if you want that to be the expectation, then as you're planning out the meeting, include that in the email and just let people know ahead of time. You know, we are hoping to have everybody included, having everyone's video on. If that's going to be an issue, let me know. Um, but otherwise it is good to communicate that out ahead of time, just in case somebody is having those circumstances and then setting that as your precedent for your meetings moving forward. Yeah. And as we all know, like communication is 50% audio, 50% visual. So it also lets you pick up on, you know, different facial expressions uh, or let's say you're actually doing lessons through, um, through, or, you know, you're doing less, a kata evaluation. It's really hard to do that if you can't see somebody. Like, oh, your arm position's off. Uh, anyway, uh, also <laughs> another best practice, hide yourself. So number one, be aware of who is watching. So like I said earlier, if you're joining a call with 300 other people on, you know, something like a Zoom meeting and you don't know who's there, 
and you don't just don't feel comfortable, it's okay to hide yourself too. Um, and also webcams might be problematic for people that have low bandwidth connections. Um, oh, my favorite feature of, of Zoom is that there's this functionality called uh, gallery view. So I'm gonna stop share just for a second. Um, all of you who are on the Zoom app itself should see right now uh, either myself, my face really large talking, or you may also see like four different, uh, four different webcams shown. Uh, the way to toggle that on or off is there's a feature uh, up on the right hand side of your screen right here that says uh, either speaker view or gallery view. So if you click on, uh, if you activate to gallery view, you can see everybody at once. So this is especially helpful when you have, again, a large group of people and you want to be able to look at everybody. Uh, it might show them on a, a few different pages if you have a lot of folks, uh, but speaker view will just show you one person who's talking. If you, act, if you click on gallery view, um, it will show you multiple people who are talking. So just a quick thing to point out there. And per the name of speaker view, it shows the person who is speaking. So you'll also notice that if you're in gallery view, um, and now you might even be able to see, well, I guess the sound is coming out on Elisa's computer, but the person who's speaking in gallery view, their box will be highlighted in yellow. So it also helps you to track who it is that's talking if you're in a sea of over 40 people. Um, whereas speaker view, that person will pop up to be the giant head on your screen when they're speaking and it will change as people change. Um. And webcams also hide yourself in an appropriate situation. If you have issues with bandwidth, like let's say your computer is really slow and you start to hear robot voices in your ear and you see that everyone else is frozen, that means that you're frozen. <laughs> and you should, <laughs> you should actually hide your webcam because there's an issue with your connection, not everyone else. So if everyone else is, uh, if everyone else is, um, Web, webcam has frozen, that means that you should probably turn yours off. Um, or if someone keeps saying to you, oh, hey, you're breaking up, I didn't, I can't, I didn't catch that, then that's a good chance for you to like, oh, let me turn off my video, did that help? And you can find out if that's the problem. Yeah. Um, and the last one is virtual backgrounds. Have fun with those. We experimented with that a little bit today too. So have fun with Zoom, uh, make it personal. I don't think we mentioned um, for the virtual background, we did, we did talk about if you don't have um, a computer that's quite up to snuff for the actual virtual background. However, for you, there is also a green screen option. So if you find that you're in the position where you have a computer that cannot handle just creating a virtual background for you, this is a great time to get creative and build your green screen. Um, I've seen folks who have worn a green sweater and then been able to display logos on themselves using green screen. Otherwise you can hang, it's like pretty literal green screen. So you yeah. can hang something behind you or you can find like a blank wall. Just the idea is not to have a lot of objects and that'll give you a better chance of getting it on the virtual fun. I'm still, I actually am in that position where I don't have a, my computer is just a little bit too old um, and can't get it so I'm experimenting with my setup and we'll hopefully come up with something successful soon. One of the guys at my company actually just today put blue tape in a square behind him like literally made a wall of blue tape and that was his green screen and he's mm -hmm. able to have um, have virtual backgrounds now because of that. So our last group of best practices number one protect the link. Um, Sarah's gonna go into this and the dangers of kind of sharing these links in a little bit, but basically you saw how easy it was to join this meeting. If you have the link, you can join the meeting. There are ways to put different protections on it. You can add in uh, things like passwords um, and other stuff like that. Uh, but generally it is really easy to join a meeting. So if you post the link on a public site, let's say you post it on your Facebook page, um, and then like your, you know, your second cousin from your aunt's side twice removed can join the meeting. Um, if, if you post it on YouTube, somebody could join a Zoom meeting. If you post it, you know, on a, if we posted this link on a TCA website, anybody could join the meeting. So it's a good idea to not, it's a good idea to protect the link. And you notice about. we did not do that. Um, so what I ended up doing after everybody got here is I went on to our event on Facebook and I said, if you are interested in joining, we've pivoted message me for access. And so I will let folks message me and then I will message them the link, but we won't post that anywhere for anybody to join to protect ourselves and the sanctity of this meeting. Um, 
The next one we've been referencing along the way also is prep for success. So this is a really new way of communicating for a lot of people and it may or may not be easy for folks to understand. So I think if you're having a meeting in this forum for the first time, it's a good idea to just set up clear guidelines. Um, you can, well, again, we'll share out the slide deck, but you can kind of pick and, and choose what you wanna uh, share with people in your community who you might be, uh, you know, who might be con conversing with on Zoom. So just make sure they know what to expect um, and how to, you know, how to, how to set uh, the meeting up for success, make sure people feel comfortable. Um, the last one we wanted to point out was if you don't know, ask. Uh, so Sarah and I are available to answer any questions. Again, this is just kind of like a tasting feature of all the things that exist within Zoom, but we know that, you know, in this day and age, there's really no limits to what you could make happen on this forum. So if you have questions about a particular situation that you would like to talk through, one of the things we didn't get to talk through uh, during this session was breakout rooms. Um, it was something that we were gonna do on the live demo, um, but th that's a really cool feature that could also be utilized to have symposiums or to do different breakout things, have small group discussions and other things like that too. Uh, you know, we can talk through those as well. So um, don't- Similarly, because we have the TCA community channels, um, if you do, want to know about something, we're also happy to workshop that with you. So if you want to try out break rooms, we can um, we can make an appointment on the Zoom scheduler and we're happy to like let you practice doing something if you think you want to host a breakout, but you kind of want to get a handle of the controls before you actually go and do it with 50 other people. Um, set up a time with us and we'd be happy to help you practice those things and get a handle on the controls. And actually as another prep for success, I would highly recommend running through a Zoom practice before you do it for the first time. As was seen today, there can be technical difficulties. So, you know, being as prepared as possible, knowing where to click, knowing where to go, the more comfortable you can get with it, the better. And we're here to help uh, in those situations. So now Sarah's gonna go through, wait, yes, Zoom bomb. <laughs> there was a question that came up um, on, our, on the Facebook post, so. Sarah is going to address that. Yeah, and I think Kurt was the one who very aptly brought this up. So Zoom bombing has become a thing. Um, and as a high school teacher myself, I'm very sensitive to this because a lot of it has been coming to light because people are breaking into children's classrooms on Zoom and doing not great things. Um, so there are best practices for protecting your link and protecting yourself from that because contrary to what media blows it up to be, it's not like Zoom is this thing that's easily hackable and anybody could jump in here at any time. We're pretty secure in this meeting as we are. That being said, um, if you have your own Zoom account and you are running this with people regularly, especially if you're using um, Zoom with students or using Zoom um, as a teacher, um, hosting webinars, hosting breakout rooms, you do wanna try and make them as safe for those people as possible so nothing goes awry. And so these are kind of the big recommendations for keeping your Zoom meeting as secure as possible. The first is restricting screen sharing. So in some instances, if somebody untoward gets into your Zoom meeting, um, oftentimes what they'll do is they'll try to share screen on something. So if you restrict screen scaring, <laughs> scaring, screen sharing to just the host, then only you can share screen. So somebody else might get in and they still might be able to use the chat, um, but they at least won't be able to put anything up. Um, Co-hosts should be able to share um, along with that. And when you go into your settings, it'll break that down and you can also change it by the meeting. So as you're in the meeting, um, if you find that somebody who is supposed to be sharing is not able to share, then you can also grant them access in that. You can pass host. Um, there's a couple of workarounds to that if you find that the panel is not cooperating you with those restricted sharing um, settings. Otherwise, the next oh, question, all of these controls are only visible, changeable by the host, correct? It's um, basically visible, changeable by the person who's hosting the meeting or by somebody who's logged into the account. So actually, technically, Elise and I are both logged into the same Zoom account right now, even though she's a host and I'm a co-host. So I do have these settings available to me for this meeting because we're sharing that account. So it's essentially whoever has access to your account settings, because if you were to go into, um, your video, for instance, go into video settings, go into general, um, you'll see a button in there that says view more settings. And what that's going to do is open up your settings panel in your account. So you're talking about your actual Zoom user account that you're logged into. And these are all settings that exist in there. 
So whomever is hosting the meeting or whomever is co-hosting the meeting, whomever is logged into the account being used, um, who owns this channel really is what it is. So Elise and I are both logged into accounts that own this channel. So we have access to all of these settings. Um, that's basically what it comes down to is who owns the account that's hosting the meeting. Um, hopefully that's clear for everybody, but keep adding to the chat if it's not and we'll elaborate. Um, a next setting for you is utilizing meeting passwords. We did not have a meeting password on this meeting because it was on the fly. Um, and that would have been just one more obstacle to get us in here, but we could turn that on. Um, and setting a meeting password, it's not the most secure thing because if you've shared out the link privately and you've been careful, then you also had to share out the meeting password and you've been careful about that. So technically, if someone could get one, they could get the other. Um, but a best practice for doing that is if you do decide to set a password for your meeting, you'd share out the link in one email. And then in a separate email, you might share out the passwords. You could let people follow up. That way, the two of them are kept isolated. And that's a general best practice for sharing passwords to anything as it is. Um, the next option for you is utilizing waiting rooms. Um, waiting rooms basically are if everybody here has a Zoom account, so it is good for you to make yourself just a free user Zoom account, um, then what can happen is you can invite people to your Zoom meeting based on their email that's associated with the Zoom account. And then in a waiting room, um, you can, it'll help you to figure out who's actually coming into the meeting. Um, so you can pre-approve people who are on your guest list. And then anybody who pops into the meeting who's not on that pre-assigned list that you've invited to the meeting will be popped into the waiting room and they're going to have to wait for you to allow them into the room as you kind of vet who they are and why they're there. Um, some people might find that you send out um, an invitation to somebody, but then they try to get on using a different email. And so that waiting room just gives you a chance to make sure that you know who's getting into that meeting. Um, on the other side, there's just basically three quick points. So disabling file transfers is a good one. So if you don't need it, it's good to disable it. That way nobody else can use it. Um, if you do need it, enable it for yourself. It's fine. Um, disable join before host would mean that if you have an open meeting, you don't want anybody else to be able to get in there before you get in there and then can vet who's going to get in there. Um, so in this case, we did not have that disabled so that you guys didn't have to wait for us as we jumped over here. But a best practice is to disable that so that the host can fully be in control from the beginning of the meeting. And then also disable allowing participants to rejoin. So for some reason, this option exists. I feel like it's gotta be a teacher thing where you ask a kid like, okay, I need you to sit out for five minutes and then come back. That's my biggest use case I could think of for this. Otherwise, if you boot somebody from your meeting, you very likely are not going to need them to come back because they got booted for a reason. So it's helpful for you to be able to use this option so that if somebody were to come into your meeting and you kicked them out, you wouldn't have to worry about them continuing to try to get in. So I hope that alleviates a lot of people's concerns about Zoom bombing. But if you have more questions or if it's still a point of concern for you, feel free to reach us out for that. Um, if you were to boot somebody from a meeting, you could go over to the side if I'm hovering over somebody's name and that's me the host or um, me the co-host or at least the host. I could hover over their name, click the more option. So the same as if you're renaming yourself and we actually have a remove option that would allow us to boot that somebody from the channel. I will not boot anybody here from the channel. Um, you can change settings while the meeting is happening, but as you saw with me in the record, sometimes they may not quickly take effect. So you may need to pass host to somebody else, leave the meeting, and then come back. It's a little bit of a tricky option when it comes to a meeting that's already been started. Um, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. I do think it's also something that Zoom is currently working on in terms of getting it updated for live changes to your Zoom room, but for the most part, once you're in the meeting, the settings that you've set are in place. So it's good to prepare and think ahead about all of these things that you might need. Any other questions? Okay, otherwise we'll move on. These are great questions, by the way. Thank you guys, keep them coming. Yeah. I just wanted to go through a couple of different use cases um, just to kind of show you what is possible. Again, because this day and age, it all can, it, we're all trying to find ways to make the digital real. So the first one that we wanted to talk about is lessons and jam sessions. So we have had a few typo groups try to meet online to have practice. Um, I know that uh, Las Vegas Common Any Cycle has tried to have practice this way as well. Um, it can be really hard to do this and align people on timing because of 
latency or basically the amount of time it takes something to exit my mouth and be heard by your ears on the other side of this internet. Uh, so a lot of factors can play into that. It can be really hard to align on timing and stuff. So some best practices with doing uh, any type of music lesson or even sometimes different types of teaching is you have other people mute. There's one person that ha takes the lead and is playing and other people play along in their location and you all have your webcams up so you can kind of see everybody. But, you know, the kind of adjusted expectations um, go along with this. It's difficult to align simultaneously. It's not going to be exactly like playing together, mm -hmm. but it can fill a need to at least, you know, visually check in with people and, uh, and get moving together mm -hmm. as well. Um, so if you're trying to have people continue to work on parts in a piece, probably the person that they're going to want to hear is if that piece has a G. So yeah. you might want the person who's primarily playing that G to be the person that everyone's listening to, and that gives everybody else the opportunity to be practicing their part synced up along with that G. But you won't be able to hear them. Maybe you can watch them. You're just going to have to kind of trust. And it's for the benefit of those people who are listening to you more so than the person giving the audio. Yeah. So this is just kind of like, uh, you know, one use case. Um, I will also say that it's dependent on hardware and bandwidth for mm -hmm. sure. So if you have some people that are in remote locations that don't have great internet connections or may not have um, a webcam available to them, uh, it can be hard to have, have this or this particular use case. Um, the next one is webinars, gatherings, and breakout sessions. So we talked a little bit about what the breakout sessions might entail. Um, and it's a really cool feature. I have not personally used it, but Sarah is an expert on it and can walk anybody through it that wants to utilize it. Um, the use case that we have here is like a drum building workshop. Let's say you want to have a full group um, session to welcome folks, but then maybe have different breakouts on different topics. Um, we could have something this way where you have people select which subgroup they want to go into and there's a way to push people into those rooms, have discussion leaders in those areas, and then bring everybody back. Um, so that's a really cool feature that exists. Sarah, do you want to add anything to this use case? Um, the only thing that I'll add is that Zoom itself does have an actually very, very excellent and concise two-minute video that details pretty much everything that's possible with breakout sessions. So we'll be sharing that out too if you're more curious about the ins and outs of um, hosting and managing a breakout session. We'll give you access to that after this webinar. Yeah. And then fun stuff. So again, um, I've had really great success with this. Uh, my Tycho group and I got together to have um, a Harry Potter trivia night on um, Zoom because we just wanted to see each other because <laughs> we spend so much time together normally. Um, so we had dinner and then we also did like a little Harry Potter escape room that somebody shared on their screen and we all kind of contributed to the answers and stuff. So again, this is a, this is a kind of like a way to make the digital real. You can share what you're eating, uh, what you can watch a movie together if you share your sound. Um, it's a great alternative to things like Netflix party or other ways to connect with folks. So um, I will also say that having been to a few happy hours with my work, um, we do happy hour every Friday on Zoom just to kind of see everybody. It can be overwhelming too, because especially if you have, you know, like 60 people on a call together, it's hard to have personal conversations that you would normally have during the happy hour. Um, and it kind of ends up just being people having fun conversations, showing their pets, which is also, you know, it fulfills a need as well. So it can be overwhelming. Um, we want to also encourage people to take screen time and non-screen time, um, but it can be a good way to have fun and, and check in and connect with folks. Mm -hmm. And this goes with planning too. So if you think about the difference between going to an event that's live or going to just like a hangout at somebody's house that live, when you're sitting here staring at a computer screen, it's actually much less likely that you're giving yourself kind of that time to walk away and then circle back to conversations that you would get in real life. So you can pre-plan those kinds of things. You know, if you're trying to host um, something with your group, like a weekly get together, pre-plan into that group meeting, oh, let's just take five minutes, everybody take a walk, like go grab a snack, go use the restroom if you need to, but be thinking about how you can maybe a little bit more mimic what it was like in real life. It's never going to be perfect in real life. That's a morbid way of putting it, I apologize. But in, in our person in the same room society, um, maybe think about ways that you can um, recreate that experience as closely as possible and be mindful of giving people 
those little bit of breaks and space. Absolutely. So we also just wanted to point out there are other solutions out there. If you are considering just video conferencing in general, Zoom is not the only option. Um, personally, I think it's the best option. I'm a huge Zoom champion. Um, GoToMeeting uh, has options as well. It has a lot of the same features that Zoom has, um, but I still think Zoom does it better. For some reason, GoToMeeting is playing catch up to Zoom a little bit. Uh, Google Hangouts is a free alternative for any Gmail um, customers out there. I will say that the webcam interface is clunky. It doesn't allow for phone dial-in, but it is a free option and it works. Um, Slack, for any of you that do have um, Slack activated for your different groups, it's mostly like a, a chat tool, um, but it also has option for, uh, for calling. On the free version, I believe you can only have one person on a call, but on the um, paid version, you can have multiple people. Uh, we use this at work as well, and it, uses, it seems to, to use a lot more uh, bandwidth, uh, and my computer slows down, and my internet connection slows down a lot more using Slack than um, on Zoom. Um, and Skype is also there. But I personally have not used Skype in a long time. Some of you may have. Uh, but I personally think that in this list, Zoom is kind of the best option for, for what it is. Um, but yeah. Any questions? I know a lot of you have been asking questions along the way, but we wanted to take some time and open up questions if any of you have them. I think at this point, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself mm -hmm. um, and we can just talk about it too. Okay. Oh, and if there are no questions, that's totally fine too. Um, you can contact us with any questions that might come up after the fact, or if you have any ideas for events that you need help executing, um, Sarah and I are both available to answer any questions. Um, our emails are included here. Um, and next week we will also have another, uh, another option uh, webinar where we'll go through some tech things for uh, streaming options. So not on live stream actually, we're actually meeting on Zoom next week, but, um, but we're gonna do a comparison and contrast of different types of streaming um, softwares. And this is not, not necessarily this one-on-one -on -one type of activity, um, but more so a, like, a, like putting out a concert. So instead of this uh, two-way communication that exists within Zoom, it would be a one-way communication with like a webinar or a live stream. Um, so we'll continue that discussion next week. Uh, but if anybody has any other questions, feel free to speak up otherwise. Kurt, did you have a question? Yeah. That was about it. You guys pretty much covered the stuff I had floating around in my head. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, this past Monday, I tried simulcasting both uh, a live stream to Facebook and YouTube. Facebook mostly worked, and YouTube was a howling pain in the butt. So yeah. that, um, and that requires yet another service. And the, mm -hmm. the lag was tremendous, like 30 seconds. Yeah, um, YouTube, YouTube Live is problematic, I think, for some folks. Um, we tried to activate it for use on uh, TCA's uh, Psychothon a few years back and also for NATC streaming. And for us, live stream was just a better tool. Um, I think that YouTube Live over time might have gotten a little bit better and may have changed and improved, but it's still a little funky, I will say. Yeah. And I think as the next month or so progress, we'll be learning a lot more about the state of what all of this tech is in. So we'll, we'll do our best to keep track of those things and keep that updated as well. I mean, as a graphic designer, I'm, I'm pretty technical, but there was all these things that, well, that's interesting. I'll get to that someday. It's all of a sudden slid into the, I need to learn all about this right now yeah. and then it's been interesting but a little on the challenging side interesting in the buddhist sense of the word and of course having to be excru excruciatingly careful if you leave your house which just adds a little more interest to it to it all i'm glad i live up on a hill in west virginia yeah oh yeah sorry Thank you, Stan. So next week's webinar <laughs> I wasn't is, listening to you when you said it. <laughs> is 6 p.m. Pacific. Whoops. 9 p.m. Eastern. My Thank bad. you for clarifying that. Thank you, Stan. 
Oh my goodness! <laughs> the eastern, <laughs> the eastern person did not type this, <laughs> which no, is also a fun person. thing to discover in video conferencing because most of the time my meetings are dark and Elise's meetings are light, but that's fine. But yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Stan. Yes, flip those times so it is yes. six p.m. Pacific and nine p.m. Eastern. Gotcha. <laughs> But that brings us to pretty much the end of our presentation. Um, but if any of you have any questions, again, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'd love to help you plan your events and hope that you take, you take advantage of TCA's uh, free uh, community Zoom options. Um, and for anybody who is interested in it, we do have a guide for you that links, it does link to Zoom's pre-existing tutorials, but what we've done, I'm posting the link in our chat now, what we've done is we've kind of cherry picked the ones that are the most common use cases and things that we're hearing from people about the most. Um, so what Zoom has compiled are a lot of text resources that are pretty quick and digestible. Um, they also have some quick video resources that are maybe two or three minute tutorials for certain things like breakout rooms, um, very specific. And then they also have some pretty epic webinars of themselves. They have their own um, introduction to Zoom It features. They have a long like 60 minute tutorial on the depths of webinars and things like that. So we've collected a lot of those particularly pertinent resources and put them up on our page so that if you are interested in learning more, you can dive into those. And then as Elise said, anything that you may have questions about, reach out to us anytime and you can practice putting them to use. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we will demonstrate that when the host ends the meeting, they can end it for all and it will safely Very boot us all point. out of this meeting at the same time. So Elise will go ahead and do that for us. And thanks, everybody. We appreciate your time. You can also stop recording. <laughs>